带来的电视辩论会。Thank you very much. My name is Chu Fan Rui. I'm from Tianjin TV. Good morning. My name is Wu Yuho. I'm from Phoenix Satellite TV. We have four popular word Chinese characters. Do you know what they are? Can we? Yeah, the. They are made in China. It's a three words in English. Yes, I was going to say goodbye to made in China and going to change it into a innovate in China or create it in China. Then what are the driving forces for China's future economy? Then we, uh, that's why I invited uh, five experts uh, to uh, have a panel discussion with you. A brief introduction of them. The first one is uh, Mr. Liu Changle, a chairman and chief executive officer of the Phoenix Satellite TV. Second one is uh, Mr. James Turley, Mr. James Turley, chairman and CEO of Ernest Young USA. And uh, Mr. Lu Hongjun uh, from Shanghai Institute of International Finance. Next, this is from the Nanfei Research Institute's Chief Advisor of South Africa, Mr. Martin Davis from South Africa. Mr. Martin Davis. Tianjin Taida Construction Company Chairman, Mr. Zhang Bingjun. Mr. Zhang Bingjun, Tianjin Taida Construction Chairman. These are five. We have already have five. Uh, panelists, but on the other hand, there will be a reporter. Professor Dan Bresnik from the United States. Welcome, Mr. Dan. To, in a new uh, economic um, model, what is the driving force, the power engine for the future economic development? This is the first topic we're going to discuss today. Mr. Lu Hongjun, uh, as an economist, what's your point on this uh, issue? First of all, I think uh, uh, we have to be really confident in China's economy. And uh, especially in the industrial uh, structural uh, transformation, and we have to improve uh, our ability on that. In the future, the industrial transformation will be uh, focusing on innovation, new technology. Second one is uh, new technology, new products. And the second one is uh, energy. We need to develop uh, alternative energy, new energies, especially the investments in this area. Third one is uh, West. We need to develop the western part of China and middle and western part of China. And uh, there is a huge potential for future industrial developments. Yes, in the new industries, uh, we need to be innovative and to find out the new growing force. What about you, Mr. Davis? Um, you have uh, been working really a uh, lot of, uh, done a lot of research on the frontier area. What's your suggest? You know, you, you started off the session by talking about um, from made in China to created or innovated in China. Now, there's been some duplication perhaps in some of the sessions yesterday and today and I'm sure tomorrow around projecting forward and talking about the Chinese economy. That's only natural. What I'd like to mention, however, is yes, as China's economy evolves and changes, what impact and what it influences is having particularly on on external, particularly emerging, developing economies, and from my perspective in Africa, and I think there's just two things to mention. Firstly, I'll give you the, the negative. Um, we have in South Africa and other economies in the region sweeping social, political instability in the mining sector because of the slowdown of China. It's very real for a job in South Africa, which is the major engine room of a regional economy, one formal job in the mining sector provides a income for 10 dependents on average. So one job, 10 people eat. You lose one job, 10 people lose an income, they lose their livelihood. There's a dramatic potential catastrophe in particularly resource-driven um, resource economies, solid minerals particularly, in our region right now because of the slowdown of China as the Chinese economy evolves. That's the bad news. The good news on the upside is what you said about manufacturing. Is uh, I heard uh, Justin Lin from, uh, from Beida, from Peking University, talking a few days ago. 
and um, he was talking about the potential shift of outward bound Chinese jobs because of rising production costs here in China. Potentially over medium term, 80 plus, 80, 80 million jobs leaving this economy. They have to go somewhere. Of course, the likes of the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia will benefit from these. But what about other emerging economies in Latin America, in Africa, uh, and potentially other regions? I think as the Chinese economy evolves, so too must other external economies, which have almost coupled to the Chinese growth phenomenon, both in a resource perspective, but beyond resources, how do we start to um, reposition and rethink around starting to capture opportunity that may move out of China as the Chinese future economy emerges? Mr. Liao, Mr. Liao is a, not only a senior uh, media expert, but also a very excellent uh, entrepreneur. So for China's uh, new, uh, future growth engine, what do you think it is? What's your point? Uh, Premier Wen, uh, yes, in his yesterday's uh, speech, also mentioned that, um, mentioned seven important new industries. These are seven uh, new industries. Uh, has uh, been well planned by the State Council. I think uh, these are uh, good choices from uh, adjustment of the uh, structure of uh, transforming of the development pattern, etc. I think it's a, a very good decision against the uh, economic environment of today. And of course, uh, from a linguistic or logistic point, these are seven concepts, whether or not they are accurate. I think uh, there needs to be a further uh, discussion and consideration. But it has already been decided by the government. For example, energy, uh, vehicle, and the new energy. They are actually belong to the same uh, category, but uh, we just uh, put uh, them into different uh, Put, uh, put them out as uh, two major development area. I think we understand that as well. New technology and new energy uh, is uh, one of the directions. But in terms of investment and development of directions, we have to uh, focus on several points. The first one, we shouldn't be blindly uh, invest in a large scale. We have to be uh, investment in a rational way, especially um, when investing in those uh, technology uh, reforming areas. Otherwise, uh, uh, excessive investment will cause uh, excessive loss because if uh, the te technology has not been upgraded, then before the technology upgrading, then you start you invest it, then there will be a lot of a loss if there is a technology upgrade. But generally speaking, uh, China's uh, seven new uh, industries decision has provided a very prosper, uh, prosperous future. Um, According to uh, 2010, uh, these, some of the industries uh, only represent 4% uh, of China's GDP. And by uh, 2020, we hope we can achieve 15%. Uh, I think uh, this is a. Uh, it means uh, each five years uh, there will be a step forward. And then by 2020, um, there will be a huge breakthrough. 15% uh, by these uh, new industries. Industry, uh, uh, representation on all the GDP. But there is a lot of work for us to do, and we have to realize this very uh, rationally and make uh, plans uh, accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Liu. You have uh, mentioned a very important issue today, that, which is uh, we have to invest in these uh, new industries, but meanwhile, we have to be really cautious instead of. Uh, Blindly investing in it. Mr. Turley, the question is, uh, we found the uh, new growth uh, points, uh, but how can we make them uh, more feasible and effective uh, while developing these uh, industries? Look, I think that many of the commentators already have talked about the great industrial strength of China. I think part of what's going to fuel China's future growth is a recognition that the industrial era will also move into a knowledge era. Uh, we're seeing globalization drive a lot more value creation in intangible products and virtual assets and intellectual property, technology is certainly impacting all of that. So I think a lot of this that is going to drive China's growth is going to be having a real more open and free exchange of knowledge within companies and even between companies. And, and that 
it, it creates a culture change when you know people realize that knowledge is not to be held close, but to be shared within a company so you can really innovate. Um, I think a piece of what's going to drive China's growth as the big state-owned enterprises continue to privatize and commercialize, oftentimes that results in some job shrinkage to be globally competitive. I think the, the twin engines of local entrepreneurship, which always builds jobs, and foreign direct investment, which again always builds jobs, will more than compensate for that. Thank you, Secretary. Zhang uh, Biujun 先生泰达股股其实是一个非常大的投资公司。那么未来新型的这些新的经济增长点、新的产业，也会是在你们考虑的范畴之内。非常想听听大家的建议。Future economic growth and those industries will be your investment target. We would like to hear your opinion on this. Just like you mentioned that, of course, we are ourselves are a large investor, investing institution in the market. In the, over the past, we have seven priorities, and recently we all we. We have also reframed our investment priority and portfolio according to government guidance. First is the regional development and real estate. In the past, we always focused on the uh, regional development, but now we focus more on real estate. Now, second is utility. Third is construction or manufacturing, and fourth is the finance. And fifth is the modern service industry. So you can see. Finance and service industry. I believe that are still only occupying a small proportion of our, of our investment portfolio, and we hope in the next five years, especially given the finance industry, we hope we can have more uh, stake in the finance industries, and we hope we can catch up with the market trend, adjust ourselves all the time to keep up with the times. So I believe modern service industry and finance industry will be top two top of our parks for you. Yes, that's right. And in the new in the first Round, we heard all the panelists, their views and their observations on the future economic growth on the new powerhouse. So uh, are, are we having any questions from the floor? Please first identify yourselves. Thank you. I'm from Nankai University. My question is for Mr. Liu. Heard, after I heard your observations, so we're not talking about powerhouse or the growth engine. We are now in an open economy, and we try to reform and open our economy to the outside world. This is a top-down process, and we try to successful experiences we can learn is to attract more foreign investment, enhance our manufacturing sector, and then to develop some high-tech zones. So industry zones as a carriers to develop and force is to enhance the supplies. So if we follow those patterns and those key points, our foreign investment, our foreign trade, our foreign reserve, our companies are all going bigger and bigger. But what will be the future powerhouse? I think in the future we're going to follow a bottom-up approach. That is to say that we need to seek more resources. And in the past we are in a very low position. In the value chain, we have some very poor division of, some poor, uh, division of the labor. I think Mr. Liu also mentioned that we need to refocus on some uh, strategic industries, on some important industries. So if we see that the central government already outlined the future blueprint and give us some directions for the future strategies and priorities, Currently, all the regions and cities, in order to implement those seven priorities, we have some challenge that is we are all following a generic approach. There is no tailor-made or prioritized agenda. So my question for Mr. Liu is how can we better establish ourselves to move our up and then establish some high-tech or unique industries to, to provide 
the power or engine to our future economy goes. So I would like to ask Liu to give us more explanation. Okay, Mr. Liu, in terms of those seven priorities by the central government, do we have any prioritized agenda or geographic locations? Uh, well, I think I already mentioned that. We need to be very prudent and cautious in this process. We cannot follow a leap forward or great leap forward approach. We need to follow step by step, gradual approach, and we cannot afford to be repetitive. We cannot uh, over invest or follow a kind of extensive economic growth pattern. So the new seven strategies from the priorities from the central government, because now we all emphasize on scientific development uh, approach. So we need to be very prudent and very rational, reasonable. How could we uh, avoid to repeat the past mistakes? And how could we better enhance our capacity to build up some new industries and new power poles? When we talk about high-tech industry, uh, scientific and technological innovation should play a leading role in this process. That's a very right direction because uh, you need first to make it right. Otherwise, the investment will lead to waste. So we have a term called technological trap. This kind of trap is very dangerous. If we overinvest in those trap and if we expand our investment too fast and fail to properly handle the balance between the technology and the investment, and then we probably won't get good return. Thank you, Mr. Liu. Yes, we need to be really reasonable and scientific towards the future investment decisions. Mr. Hu, your turn. Okay. Mr. Turley, I think you can give us some few new points. Yeah, I, I just wanted to amplify something that the question Questioner talked about. He talked about you know top-down processes and in the future bottom-up processes. Many countries around the world are actually striving to create innovation centers. Skolkovo in Russia comes to mind. There are many others, and China's doing the same thing. And I think the the tension that is going to take place is between the top-down and the bottom-up, because Thomas Friedman wrote a, an interesting editorial that I read a couple of years ago. And he said, top-down innovation is usually very orderly, very planned, very controlled, but not very smart. Mm -hmm. Bottom-up innovation is chaotic, it's haphazard, but it's brilliant. And so I think for China to get that balance between the top-down and bottom-up is going to be crucial. I'm very confident the country will, but I think that balance is important. But I'm curious for one thing. In your company, you were more is a smarter way, or? Well, we, we, we spend a lot of our time working with the best entrepreneurs in the world, mm -hmm. all around, from mm -hmm. all four corners of the earth. And we think that really bottoms up innovation created within an ecosystem that has funding, academic research, a whole array of great ideas, bringing people with different perspectives together is the best way to, to ensure well, success. What a, what a I want to add a couple of points. Just now we talk about bottom-up approach. If we extend the topic a little bit, then that the key is new energy or new seven priorities. What so the key here is new, the market. If we can ex explore or develop the downstream market, if we have a mature downstream market, and then we can remove that bottleneck. The government, if only think about future guidance and our policy guidance, and then they probably will also need to think of those pragmatic things. Uh, so if we focus on market and extend the market concept to cover those seven priorities or seven industries, only by doing so you can can truly push the economy to going forward. I think Mr. Turley and Mr. Liu, they all touch upon a very key topic, that is seven priorities are actually help us identify seven growth poles. Whether we can deliver this strategy, that still depends on our market reform, whether we still can deepen our market reform, which approach we should follow, top, top down or bottom up. So what kind of role the government should play? Me, Professor Liu, whenever we talk about about Chinese economy. We always emphasize we have our unique characteristics, we have a macro regulation or guidance from the central government, but now we're in the difficult economic downturns. So you think the central government should follow the same approach for the macroeconomic management? I think in China, 
institutional economics is a very key topic here. Over the past 30 years of the development, the central government has been adapting itself in playing different roles. Premier Wen yesterday mentioned that they are constantly adjusting their macroeconomic regulation in line with the real uh, market uh, symptoms or effects. I think macroeconomic regulation has three categories. First is the hard uh, Finding uh, macroeconomic regulation, for example, four trillion stimulus package. You need four trillion, and we input four trillion. So this is a kind of a hard regulation. Second category is soft regulation. Soft regulation refers to some industrial policies. You need to guide industrial policies. And I think the key here is we need some uh, smart regulation. Smart regulation is a kind of invisible hand to guide the innovation, guide development. So I remember that back in 1993, when I was participating in a World Bank meeting uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, because back then, the situation in 1993 uh, is pretty much similar to what we have today when we talk about competitiveness uh, the competitiveness, competitiveness is not from the exchange rate, it's from actually from um, a government's capacity in allocating resources and positioning itself for in the global economy. So during that time, the uh, senior uh, Larry Samus, Mr. Larry Samus, the, the senior economic advisor to the president in the United States, he mentioned a couple of key points. Number one, through investment trade, you need to uh, promote economic development, not relying on tax cut. I think the second point, uh, prudent monetary and fiscal policies, uh, not rely, so not proactive monetary policy. It's a prudent fiscal and monetary policy. So this kind of uh, observation are actually verifying some uh, ongoing practices in developing countries. They are following this kind of approach to realize their economic potential. So according to your observation, the key is not on regulation, it's on actually regulation tactics or your strategies. So I noted, Mr. Turley, you nodded. So you, according to your opinion, you think China need to reform its regulation approach or strategy? No, I, I think China is absolutely doing the right things and on the right path. But I think having smart regulation, not no regulation, is what I was nodding at. Because, you know, some, some in business would say, just on, you know, let us alone. I think we need to have smart regulation. The invisible hand you talked about is very smart. What is so crucial, though, is the comment that the chairman made about the market. Every successful entrepreneur I know, and I've met them all around the world, they all start with what's happening in the marketplace, what the needs are that are out there. They see these needs. They have a vision to create a product or a service to meet the need they've identified. They have the courage to take risks and risk their own assets to build a, a, a business. And then very importantly, they have a persistence to actually pick themselves up, dust themselves off when they fail. Because most successful entrepreneurs did not succeed the first time they tried. And so it all starts with the market, as was pointed out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Davis, Mr. Davis, do you have a different opinions about Chinese regulation? For example, regulation on Chinese real estate market, and this is a very controversial topic. So I do think in the next couple of years, uh, what kind of hand we need from the central government? Just, you know, that's the prime example, but I think what it broadly reflects in China is this tension between the state and enterprise. And I think the key no discussion will be complete without a, a very thorough investigation of the future role of the state, state and enterprises in this economy. What, you know, viewing from the outside, Chinese commentators are, you're too hard on yourselves. This is an economy which is 7% odd in the deepest, darkest economic period potentially ever. Um, in our part of the world, 7% is a target. It's a dream. It's not a slowdown. I think what is the Chinese state ultimately has become the entrepreneur. 
Listening to Wen Jiabao's speeches today, it's all economic statistics, it's all about growth, it's all about economic delivery, and those, the, the KPIs are purely economic. Um, I think what has been created has been an, almost a Darwinian, highly competitive uh, environment, incredibly competitive. And this is the, I mean, the intangible drive of growth in this economy, I would argue. Move away from Beijing, move away from the state, but it's intense competition and the survival of a fittest sort of mentality in that private sector. You have a relatively protected cash hoarding at times state and enterprise sector. I think and even now at these re this relatively early stage of China's outbound capital, outbound capital, companies, talent, is the ones who are succeeding are the private companies. And this is unique to China's uh, political economy, where successful private companies almost get adopted by the state. It's not about ownership, it's about a, a foreign commercial policy nationalism. And I think when one's looking starting abroad, the, the, the success cases I'm seeing right now, beyond the, the oil companies obviously, beyond the extractive industries, we're seeing these private companies, uh, as you mentioned, market-driven, market-aware, but have almost been adopted or aligned to the state's nationalistic foreign commercial policy interests. Those are the companies for me that are interest, a very strong interest going forward. Thank you. Uh,其实我比较同意这个马丁先生的这个观点,就是说呢,我们其实对我们自己的政府确实是要求太高了。这个,因为中国毕竟还是一个这个,还是一个发展中的国家,还是一个经济处在一个这个增长的过程中,还
absorbing jobs which, which Guangdong or Fujian used to receive are now going to Vietnam. We're seeing similar effects in Cambodia, Indonesia, Philippines to an extent, um, maybe even further afield to the likes of Sri Lanka and South Asian economies. For us in Latin America and Africa, we're saying, well, how do we at least take advantage of this geoeconomic shift taking place in the Chinese economy? As you are very rapidly moving up the value chain, clearly, is how do we start to get on the, the bottom rung, perhaps, of labor-intensive um, bottom-end industrialization? How do we more, be more proactive in attracting these jobs to, um, to, uh, to our parts of the world? The last comment is that uh, the most memorable conversation I had last year, i never forget, was with a professor at Tsinghua University. And he told me very, very briefly that the biggest challenge China has, currently we, we China, have approximately 96 million tertiary graduates, tertiary university educated graduates in this country. We have over 200 million, 225, I think he said, uh, blue collar industrial labor intensive manufacturing workers. In the next 10 years, maybe by 2020, eight, nine years, between in the next decade, the biggest challenge China has is how do we replace 225 million blue collar workers with, again, generating 10 million graduates a year on average with 200 million mm -hmm graduates, white collars. That's the shift. The question for us is how do we get those blue collar workers from China into our own economies? Mm -hmm. 好,谢谢,谢谢David先生的回答,谢谢。接下来呢,小蕊还有有关于企业如何来增加它的这个产业链,还有国家产业链。How can the business improve its value chain? The cell phone value chain. Let's start from the iPhone. The price of it is 6,600 and the US companies are making 405.96 US dollars. And the Korean companies are making uh, US dollars, but Chinese companies are making a very small part of the profit. This is unsustainable. So we have to discuss how can China businesses improve its uh, position on the global value chain. This is a very important issue because uh, the model of the old, the old model should be a uh, get rid of, and we need to uh, have a new model. So, Mr. Liu Changle, what's, do you, what do you think is the key uh, strategy for us? Yeah, the data, I did the calculation um, based on the data you provided. China only... Mm-hmm. 所有这些国家包括附加值的那些钱全部算在中国人脑袋上了这是不公平的但是呢确实我们看到中国的这个转型呢一些国家沦落他们一样 R&D这个数据里边呢应该说呢中国的这个数据呢是非常可怜的中国的数据呢在每万名的劳动力一年中只有二十二个人 
two. But China is only, uh, the number for China is only 22. Uh, 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 the other countries is five to ten times that of China. So, what is the problem with China? We have to try to figure it out. China has to rethink about its uh, direction of investments and area of investments. So Yi Hu didn't ask me to answer that question. Can I just uh, make, up, uh, uh, make an extra remark about the uh, relations between China and market? Government role. What kind of role should government play? This is very sensitive. So what's your point? Um, it is very important as well. Because, for example, if we would like to stress on uh, the uh, government function, then probably we'll ignore the function of markets. But if we overstress the function of the market, uh, government, then we'll uh, ignore the uh, government of the, uh, the uh, function of the market, for example, the fiscal issue. If it is highly centralized, then the economic and development will be restricted. And, but if we uh, uh, decentralize the fiscal power to different local governments, then China probably would be the second uh, Spain. So what role should China play on Earth? Three functions are very important. The first one is uh, investor of the large projects. For example, infrastructure and the large industries. For example, air um, flights, uh, uh, airlines, and uh, aerospace, and uh, major R&D projects or major research directions, uh, all these need to be supported financially by the government. Second uh, function for the government is the uh, founder of the market order and also buyer for the uh, market direction. So the major function for the government, if we can summarize uh, the, the above mentioned points together, it should guide China's economy to a more regular, regulated market economy. That's the function of the government. Thank you, Mr. Liu, for your sharing your points. Uh, these are the issues uh, that government should think. How can we uh, guide the market to a more effective uh, operation? Yes. Yeah, to improve the uh, scale of the market. Yeah. So, Mr. Liu has already made his uh, uh, remark about the previous question. So, how can we uh, improve our position on value chain, uh, technology investment, and the talent training? So, what about you, attorney? What's your point of view on the value chain issue? Well, I think the, you've, you've hit on the important issue. I mean, moving up the value chain is going to be central to China's continuing growth and economic power into continuing the job growth that is so, so desperately needed. And so I think that there's a few different dimensions that come to mind. Um, one is to perhaps get many in the, the companies to work with government and backwards integrate to the universities to make sure the universities are actually training the kind of skill sets that they need in a knowledge economy. As we talk, you know, we talked about the three levels of industrial production, moving up the value chain is incredibly important. It takes different skills to do that. So I think companies need to work with the universities, either you know, the research universities or even you know, technical and vocational universities to actually drive the skill sets needed. I think the second thing that's needed to actually you know, capture this as, as you go forward you know, China does pretty well, I'd say quite well, in the world as far as patent identification and securing. I think they do less well historically in commercializing those patents. And so I think, you know, having the government and having the society move more towards a commercialization um, end game and a goal of actually building companies that will take a, a patent and, and build a product that they've identified a need for in the marketplace will go a long way. Thank you, Mr. Turley. We have to take uh, steps uh, in order to improve ourselves on the value chain. So what about you, Davis? Uh, one of the major concerns for all of us is uh, if we cannot improve ourselves right now, then China's economy's uh, future would be uh, very stale. Uh, probably will face a more problem than Latin America. Um, so China has already entered into a stage we have to adjust our strategy. Mm. Do you think? What do you think? 
Look, I, I think there's, um, again, I repeat, I, I, think, I think you're being overly critical of oneself. We all tend to criticize our own countries, but I'm seeing enormous amount of self-criticism unnecessarily so here in China. I, I go back to, there's, there's a couple of points here. Firstly is, is capital is clearly not a problem. Uh, talent and the surplus of talent perhaps, maybe not entirely the critical mass of, of, of internationally experienced talent of course is lacking, but domestic talent who play a very strong home game is undoubtedly there. I think thirdly, and, and, and one thing from a, a developing world perspective is, is strong institutions, strong public sector institutions. Um, which, which again, which reinforce the ability of a state to become an entrepreneur. Um, the internal competition issue. I think the intangible driver, but not often not spoken about enough driver of growth in this country, is the intensity of competition one sees in in, in, in the economy. Intensity of competition between companies, between, between individuals, particularly between citizens. The intensity of that. And I think lastly, however, what no one has mentioned so far, and it's a discussion for undoubtedly another time, but we, we're living in very, very changing, interesting times here in China right now. And all of us, the future of the Chinese economy, and, and all our Chinese friends will um, hopefully agree with me, is predicated on the good management of politics. Mm -hmm. It really is. So you cannot have an economic discussion without a political discussion because politics ultimately will lay that foundation upon which this entire future economy we're talking about is being predicated. Uh, just now Mr. Liu has already mentioned that science and talents uh, are the major drivers for the improving or challenging uh, positions of the, on the value chain. What do you think? Okay. I don't think uh, people will object that. I agree as well. And personally, I think uh, you mentioned about the value chain. I would like to go back to the uh, initial question of yours. Uh, personally, uh, my experience is uh, uh, very complicated. I was a uh, uh, plant head, uh, uh, manager of a plant for eight years. I was also a head of a research institute for about six years. So in terms of talents, technologies, uh, and uh, the uh, different uh, levels of the value chain, I have probably a different point of view uh, from the other uh, panelists. Minor the uh, division of the value chain globally, I agree with what you are uh, your analysis. People are trying to improve to the higher end instead of uh, staying at the lower end. So back in the 1980s in Shenzhen, we are at the lower level, and that is not sustainable because uh, it is uh, um, consuming a lot of uh, labor uh, dividends and resources and a lot of public wealth in order to achieve a short-term high uh, speed of development. But uh, this uh, Issue. And this uh, kind of a development cannot be negated uh, very uh, strongly or people cannot just say that we would like to get rid of uh, made in China, we would like to develop uh, into a stage where it is uh, innovated in China. Manufacturing back in the 80s and 90s indeed uh, created a lot of jobs for China. And now a lot of uh, private companies are still in that stage. They are still uh, manufacturing at a lower uh, part of the value chain, and we need that as well. So the division of the value chain is getting finer and finer in the world, that is in line with uh, economic development, but we cannot just uh, simply generalize that to lo manufacturing belongs to the lower end uh, part of the value chain, and we should get rid of it. No, we shouldn't say that. We still need it. Just now, I fully agree with uh, Mr. Liu about the technological trap. I was once the head of R&D center. R&D requires a huge amount of investment, and it's a very risky attempt or effort, and it requires lots of talents and people. So we, the market, the government, the researchers, and the general public, they don't have the patience to wait. They're always, uh, are, they're always very pushy for the results. And so they only can wait like one year, and the second year they require the immediate results. So I think China 
In order to transform economy, of course, we need to move up along the value chain, but we need a vast manufacturing sector as the base of our economy. And of course, the investment in human capital is very important. Mr. Lu, I want to add one point. When we talk about value chain, we need to emphasize moving up along the value chain. This is a kind of global consensus. So here, financial services is an important topic. In China, this is a top priority. Recently, we have collaborated with a R&D center in Heilongjiang, and we talk. We have researched a financial chain or industrial chain uh, in the country. And we found out that as long as you have the kind of a financial services or systems in place, and then actually it can facilitate the development of other sectors, sectors and industries. So I think investment and finance. They are actually like putting the seeds in the ground or in the soil. They provide the money capital to feed those companies and sectors. If we only consider investment as a kind of harvesting activities, that's why people have those kind of bias. And actually, investment of finance, financial services, we need to be very reasonable. And this is kind of a payment from payment first, seeds, and then lead to the, oh, Mr. Turley. Yes, please. Real quickly, there's another perception I think we need to sort of make sure we have right. Uh, sometimes we think about innovation mm. and moving up the value chain is only about, you know, the next Google or the next Apple or whatnot. Innovation is also about dramatic improvements in manufacturing processes and innovation within the industrial sector that actually substantially increase productivity. So if you think about the comment that was made earlier about the chart that, that you showed, that kind of innovation in the industrial sector extends the life of the great manufacturing we have here and makes it very, very competitive globally. Yes, indeed. Innovation will definitely play a vital role in China's future economy. And just now we shared corporations on how to better move ourselves up along the value chain and how could we better create more jobs. And we need re-innovation. We need finance or funding. Financial services as you see to help us. So do we have any questions from the floor? The lady first. Thank you. Thank uh, my you. question is to uh, Mr. Turley. I'm from Donghua University from Shanghai. So my question is, uh, how do this university prepare or prepare ourselves, or uh, how do we identify ourselves in this process of promoting the status of China in this value chain? I know you said we should work with the government. So could you explain it more uh, specifically? Thank you. Yeah, I think universities, not just here in China, but around the world, are, are at a very interesting point in their, their life cycle because the skills needed in not just China, but many countries around the world for success in the future are somewhat different than the skills that have been needed in the past. And so I think, you know, having a real tighter integration between the corporate sector, the university sector, and the governments is important to actually make sure that what, you know, many universities are government driven, what, what is being taught, what is being trained, what is being experienced by the students is actually fit for the purpose of the companies that you're looking for jobs in. And so I think that's what all universities are, are struggling with. I'm a trustee at, at my alma mater where I graduated. We're all trying to figure out how do you do the right things. And, and, and so that's the challenge that's taking place. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turley. And then Mr. Hu. Okay, thank you, Xiao Fenri. Uh, no matter is how to find the power, how to future economic growth, no matter is uh, moving up along the value chain, we are all trying to improve the livelihoods of the general public. I wonder, my question is, uh, any one of you want to tell us what will be your annual salary? I think you probably won't share this 
this information with you. Look at this. We have the slide, and then you find the per capita GDP share in China. This is a comparison. This is 08713 and 3700 in 2008 and 2012. It's 5432. So here we have a question. We have problem. The West is now all talking about all kinds of middle income trap. This is China. So probably many countries have suffered this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries have had this kind of stagnation. But some countries And what would be your impression? I think for middle income uh, level, we have different opinions in China. People are talking about what exactly the level for middle income, how much you consider as a middle income. So in we now using the 2005 statistics from NBS National Bureau of Statistics. We use that as a benchmark. And according to NBS. Fifty thousand to four hundred thousand RMB annually for a household as a kind of bracket for a middle income. So currently, if we use this as a benchmark, now we have like four point five percent, and we believe that by twenty twenty, China is going to have a forty five percent. So. So, so-called middle-income trap. We have all sorts of discussions. It's a kind of a very controversial and heated topic. This is good. It shows that general public is paying attention of the middle-income trap, and the general public has this kind of awareness of such trap. We know the lessons from Brazil, and we know the lessons from all experiences of Korean. I think. Brazil can really teach us a good lesson uh, because they suffered a stagnation in this middle income trap. And then we can learn what we can really learn from them is all about innovation and institutions as well as the government corruption. So I'm not quite sure whether we have some delegates from Brazil or participants from Brazil. Of course, my information are all from the literature. So I'm not, I don't have any first hand information. But Korean, let's look at Korean and they. They follow the different path. This is a very useful experience we can learn. Uh, when they reach the 10,000 US dollars, and then they have the financial crisis, and then the financial crisis drags them down from 10,000 to 7,000 US dollars, and then they rebound back to the 11,000 US dollars. Now they have uh, 20 and 500,000 per capita US dollar income. So you can see. Uh, China's uh, number is only 5,400. 5,400, uh, what kind of ranking for China? That is 87. So some people are thinking that China will move up uh, along this ranking very quickly. And they think, so we can see from 2003 to 2005, 2005 to now, we have a big jump. But whether China will repeat the same mistakes of Brazil, I think now we have a very good environment. Because the general public do have this kind of uh, very uh, good awareness of this uh, dangerousness, and I think China probably will follow the Korean path and make it happen. So I, my question is, uh, Dave, Davis, and I know that you spent some years in Korean, and what kind of lessons you think we can learn from Korean? Certainly, I um, the most perhaps accelerated learning period of my life was in November 1997. I was living in Seoul, and the, it was when the IMF, which the Koreans of the time were calling IMF equals I'm fired. <laughs> and the economy literally was almost in meltdown of November, December 1997. But this middle income trap, I'll talk about Korea shortly, but this middle income tra trap thing is quite simple. You see it in Brazil, you will see it in the not too distant future in India. You already have it in South Africa. It's all about bringing the majority along with the growth. Whatever headline number you have, divided by a big number, will be a small number. And as long as you're going to have a majority of people, like Brazil, like South Africa, who are not 
part, really, part of the economy. They're not exposed to the education opportunities. They're not part, maybe not even formal employment. Certainly not exposed to these things we call technological innovation and the like. Those, those people, that large pool of people, will always result, the headline number will be diluted to a small number. And that effect is a middle income trap. It's because of the disparities. Korea certainly has surpassed that because of largely um, relatively smaller population, mm -hmm. extremely competent state, again, the competitiveness thing, strong institutions, but above all, above all, and this applies to China more than anywhere, is equal access to opportunity. Mr. Turley, you think China, whether China can overcome the middle income uh, trap? One minute, please. I think they absolutely can. You look at the chart that you just showed of, of the increases in income. Uh, by comparison, where I grew up in the United States, you know, we've seen middle income go down 10 percent in about that same time period. So I think China can overcome this. I think access to opportunity and education is absolutely the key. And I think many of the things that we've been talking about in this panel throughout will, will help facilitate that. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> Mr. Lu, I think like Argentina, the reason why they're following this middle income trap because their financial sector was faced with a daunting challenge and they have a poor public security. So that's why some financial multinationals, they, are leave, they left Argentina. So I think for China, you need to develop the financial sector greatly. And uh, uh, recently, we visited Harbin University. And when I was giving a lecture, I told them that don't leave Heilongjiang province. In Heilongjiang, in this province, Province, the rural finance system will have a great prospect. So, Mr. Zhang, I have a, a give you a privilege. You're from a uh, state-owned enterprise, so people talk about that the key lies in SOEs. SOE need to share more dividends to the central treasury and then distribute to the general public. I fully agree with that, actually. We're just a holding group. We're just a holding group. And we hope our subsidiaries can like, submit and their uh, profits and the dividends hold in a full amount to us. And as a Minister of Finance, if I were Minister of Finance in China, of course I would hope to get all the dividends and profits from the companies to support national development. I fully agree with you. I still want to talk about middle income. I'm fully confident about China's future prospect. I think middle income is a kind of average number in China. We have a huge market domestically. I fully agree with the Premier Wen. He visited Sichuan province a few days ago. I was in Beijing. My driver got lost. We want to reach South Third uh, Ring Road, and then we reached uh, Finally, we actually get to the fifth ring road uh, in the south. So if you go in the south uh, on the fifth ring road, it's pretty much like a rural countryside. It's not a capital city at all. So you can see this kind of development gap of Thank you, thank you, all the panelists. So now we only have 30 seconds. I think we all share observations and wisdom from each and every panelist, and we all believe that everybody is, has this full confidence of the China's future prospect. My, I only have two points. I want to require the general public, all of the participants, give a big hand to the Mr. Zhang as the SEO of the SOE. We agree to share more profits with us. Thank you. And second point, all the other four panelists, maybe they have different opinions with Mr. Zhang, but they do have one common consensus, that is uh, we have hope, we have confidence, and confidence and hope are coming from with us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.